for leading us in worship this morning. I want y'all to pray for Will. We've got him in our residency program, up and coming pastor. Amen. Also pray for Larry, up and coming pastor in our residency program. Amen. Also pray for uh, uh, Martin Escobar. Sorry about that. I couldn't think of your first name for a second. Mart Martin Escobar, he's an associate pastor here in one of our churches. Pastor Sammy Davis, also associate pastor. I mean, if you like me, I lose count of all these pastors, and I lose their names sometimes. You can tell. And I don't know what's going on. God just keeps sending more and more people here uh, to get tra <coughs> trained trained and sent out to pastor churches or stay here if they'd like, but I feel like we're just giving away the church all the time, but Lord just keeps sending more and more people, amen, and we're just seeing the kingdom of God spread. So that's what we're all about. <clears throat> if you're wondering, that's what we Southern Baptists are all about, amen, the Great Commission. And so this morning, we have the great honor of hearing Dr. Bart Barber, who uh, serves as pastor of First Baptist Church, Farmersville, Texas. He's been there since 1999, I believe. So uh, has a BA from Baylor University, and he's, he was part of the University Scholars Program there. So he uh, got a MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, which I believe the president of that seminary is here. And uh, so let's give this brother a hand. Dr. Bart got his doctorate from uh, Southwestern in church history, but beyond pastoring, Dr. Barber has served our SBC in many ways, such as first vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He preached in the pastor's conference. He served in the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention on the executive board for many years, including being chairman and, and vice chairman. He served as a trustee of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary for many years, actually taught as an adjunct professor there for several years. He served on the SBC Committee on Committees and the Resolution Committees. He's here today with his wife and uh, his and children. You have your children here today? Da okay, all right. So good to have them with us this morning. And I believe that his family serves, it's his wife and so forth, with the Southern Baptist Disaster Relief. And uh, she even coordinates... Uh, a major part of, uh, I think, the Texas Baptist men uh, for caring for children during the aftermath of, uh, aftermath of disasters. So, as you can tell, I don't know Dr. Barber personally. I'm having to read all this. I'm getting to know you, brother. And it's such an honor to have you here. And the more I read about you, it, there's a lot of things that um, drew my heart towards you. We've got a lot of things in common. Surrendered to preach really at a very young age. I did the same thing. I saved when I was seven started preaching when I was 12, and you were about the same li line there in, in, in age. But I think you started pastoring your church as a senior in high school. Did I read that? And so that's amazing. So been serving the Lord basically all his life. And, uh, but the one thing I noticed about this, brother, that, that I really like, I noticed this, and I noticed it again this morning, is he wears boots when he preaches. <laughs> now, that's a real Texan right there, Right? But it reminded me, I mentioned a moment ago that Bill Stafford was part of Phil and I's, uh, when we were coming up and, and getting ordained. Uh, did you know Bill Stafford, the evangelist, Southern Baptist evangelist? He used to always say that he hoped that he died, that he would, one day when he died, he'd die with his boots on. I, even, I think he called them his preaching boots. And uh, so anyway, today, I want you to welcome Dr. Bart Barber and his preaching boots. Amen? Come on up here and bring the Word of God. Amen. Thank you, Jason. What a, what a great start. Thank you. All right, boy, I tell you, I have enjoyed being here this morning. Uh, very encouraging to me to be led in worship. Will, thank you so much, and all the rest of the team for bringing us to the throne of God. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy, and we're going to be taking a look at the entire third chapter of the book of 2 Timothy. So if you would, uh, get your device ready or your, uh, or your printed Bible and, uh, and navigate. And while you're finding that passage of Scripture, let me tell you that uh, these boots were actually a gift from my church because I was born in Lake City, Arkansas, native Arkansas. It is. And when I had been there 20 years, they said, 20 years is enough. We're going to declare you an honorary Texan. And every Texan ought to, ought to own a pair of boots. And so they gave me 
these preaching boots uh, at that occasion. Uh, but I can tell you that, uh, that the place I grew up, Lake City, Arkansas, uh, it's really it's the great lie. There's no lake and it's not a city. Uh, but that's still the name of it somehow. And uh, so all of you are from L.A., but I'm from L.C. And uh, we'll see how that works out here today. I'm blessed by the things that God causes to bring us together. Even though we have differences, uh, we can see that there are many ethnicities that are represented here this morning. Wow, this church is doing something amazing, reaching out to share the gospel with this community. I'm just so excited about that. I'm about to cancel my plane ticket and stay right here. <laughs> Because I can get pumped up about what you guys are doing here at Huntington Beach. And, uh, and, and there, are, there are differences in ethnicity. There are differences in age. There are differences in geography. Uh, but the Spirit of God brings together His children in ways that are more important than all the things that separate us. And so I'm thrilled to be here today. I want to invite you. I know you've been standing a lot. Stand one more time uh, in honor of God's Word as we read 2 Timothy chapter 3. But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all just as Jonas's and Jambres's folly also was. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and became convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus." All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Please be seated, and let's take a look together at the text that God has given us today. There's a lot of information in 2 Timothy chapter 3, but there are only three commands in this entire chapter. In other words, you're told about a lot of things in what we've read, but you're told three things to do. And I want us to look at those today. The first one is this. You are given a prophecy and you're told to accept it. And that's right here in the very beginning of this chapter, in the very first sentence. It says, but realize this. Another way of saying that is, wrap your mind around this. Come to understand this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. God has prophesied to us that in the last days, difficult times will come. And I want you to understand that the last days here is not talking about tomorrow, it's talking about today. Difficult times are upon us today. In fact, they're stacking up so quickly, we don't even know how to process them. I mean, we've had COVID, 
And that's two years ago, and we're still talking about it. We're still trying to recover from it. We're still trying to figure out what it's done to us. And then on top of that, we've had political unrest and turmoil in our country. They've caused families to be at war, at odds with one another, friendships to be broken. And it's so sad that at Thanksgiving now, the news articles that you see in the newspapers are not about how blessed we are, even though we are greatly blessed, even though the per capita average family income in the United States of America is around $25,000, which may not sound like a lot to you, it'd be hard to get by on that in Huntington Beach, maybe. But the per capita average household income in Senegal, where my church is at work planning a church, is $1,000 a year. We're number five in the world of the richest per capita income anywhere. You would think that when Thanksgiving would come, that we'd have news article after news article talking about how blessed we are and how we ought to give thanks. But instead, you know what I see on social media and in newspapers and advice columns and whatever else? Help me know how to get along with my family, that we argue with one another about politics and about societal trends and everything else. We experience all of that in the midst of that. We've had protests and riots break out in our cities all over the country. And just this week, someone attempted to shoot an associate Supreme Court justice. Now hold on, not only is that true, but I don't think it even made it above the fold in our newspapers. The attempted assassination of a Supreme Court justice. Why? Because how can it compete with killing seven and eight year olds in public schools? How can it compete with the way that in the midst of every moment when we could pull together, something seems to tear us apart? And that's all just talking about the things the world is experiencing. But then take a look at what we're experiencing in our churches. Some of what we're experiencing in our churches is that in many places the tensions of the world are bleeding in to the relationships that we have with one another inside the church. And on top of all of that, for those of you who've been paying attention to life in the Southern Baptist Convention, and I'm not... I'm not here to talk a whole lot about the Southern Baptist Convention today, because God brought me to Huntington Beach Church today, and I want us to have something that we can all benefit from today. But I, but I just want to mention, because it affects you too, your Southern Baptist Church, and you've seen in the news, we've had this sex abuse task force that's been released. That's something that is not just a, a, an isolated matter, just to clergy, or just to churches, or just to a few churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. The fact of the matter is, so statisticians tell us that whether it was at home, whether it was at school, whether it was at the doctor, whether it was in an athletic program, that as many as one in four of the women who are in this room will have experienced sexual abuse at some point in their lives. Premarital counseling a few years ago at FBC Farmersville, when I sat back and looked at the tally of the year for the marriages that I had done, more than 60% of the couples that had come for me, to me for premarital counseling, the wife to be had been through some kind of sexual abuse in her lifetime. Mom's boyfriend, the guy who lived next door, someone at school, an older boy took interest in them. You can understand why one of the most popular songs that's been written in Christian circles in the last few years starts with the line, do you feel the world is broken? We do. But God has prophesied that in the last days, difficult times will come. And he has commanded us to wrap our minds around that and to understand that this is exactly what God told us was going to happen. He wants us to understand that for a couple of reasons. First of all, he wants us to understand that so we won't be demoralized. I heard somebody really wise say that expectations are just disappointments waiting to happen. I think that was your pastor who said that. 
preaching just a few weeks ago. Amen? And God tries to help us in His Word to set our expectations according to what is realistic. Now, our ultimate expectation is exactly where Will said it was a moment ago. Our ultimate expectation is in heaven. Our ultimate expectation is in a place where God the Father has promised that He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. A place where there'll be no more sickness. Go ahead. No more war. No more death. No more sin. No more corruption. No more abuse. And yet God has called us to have a realistic expectation of what we face today. That the prophecy of God is true and that difficult times will come. That's the first command for you to accept that prophecy, for you to wrap your mind around the truth of that. Now the second command that God gives us in 2 Timothy 3, He tells us that there is a pathway that people take and that we are to avoid that pathway and those people. I want you to notice what it says to us in this passage of Scripture in verse 5, after talking about some people, at the end of verse 5 it says, avoid such men as these. Who are these people? These people are the reason why the times are difficult. Now, I know there are all manner of natural calamities that come against us. I'm more aware of that now than ever before. Because you people have these earthquakes up out here, and I'm just counting the time I get on an airplane and go back to where I know I'm not going to fall off into the ocean. (laughs) The earth is shaken by sin as well. And, uh, And yet... Even in the midst of natural disasters, if people are helping, we always make it through, don't we? Man, that's why I'm so proud of, of not, thank you for mentioning Tracy and her ministry in disaster relief, but Southern Baptists are so great about going and reaching out to people when natural calamities come against them. A tornado swipes through the place, or, a, or, or an earthquake comes, or flooding, a river gets out of bounds, or a hurricane makes landfall, and, and it's like the, uh, Brian Williams said on the nightly news several years ago in Oklahoma after a tornado where he said, you know, if you're waiting on the government to come fix things for you, you're going to be waiting a long time, but the Baptist men are going to get it done tomorrow for you. And it just makes everything better. You hear the testimony from people like a man named Joe who came from Germany and somehow found his way to Farmersville, Texas. And we had a tornado come through. And Southern Baptists at First Baptist Farmersville and other churches pulled together and went and ministered to him. And Joe had not been to church in a long, long time. We're sharing the gospel with him then, and we're continuing to do that now. But Joe said, you know, all my friends in Germany say that those Americans are selfish and arrogant and, and they won't do anything to help anybody else in the world. But he said, I've learned that there's a different side to that story. He said, you people have helped me in ways that I've never seen anybody help anybody before. And he said, I don't know if it's America or if it's Texas or if it's just you Christian people. I tried to explain to him what it was. In response to that, the gospel of Jesus Christ moves us to be people who help other people. But my point is just to say, natural disasters can come against you, and when people show up in the name of Jesus Christ to help you through that calamity in your life, we make it through okay. But when we start biting and devouring one another, even if everything else is okay, it's a difficult time. For us to go through. God pointed out to us that the thing that will make these difficult times come, in verse 2 he says, it's because of what men do. And he described what was wrong with them. And it's something that we see in the world all around us today. First of all, he said they love all the wrong things. He says, men will be lovers of self. Esteem yourself. Respect yourself. Care for yourself. 
love yourself, placing all of the emphasis on their own egos, lovers of money, lovers of reputation and superiority because they're boastful and they're arrogant. It says later on that they're people who are lovers of pleasure in verse 4 rather than lovers of God. Some people love all the wrong things. When love wins, it's only a win if it's the right kind of love. If you love all the wrong things, love can lead you in difficult times. It said also that they were folks who protest all the wrong things. They're against all the wrong things. Look at what he said. He said, they're revilers. That's a word that means that they are against giving honor to God. They're against God. They're against their parents. Disobedience to parents. They're against gratitude. Because listen, if you were in favor of gratitude, you'd love God and your parents. You'd give thanks to them for the things that they've done. But these folks are ungrateful. They're, they're contra because gratitude means giving credit to somebody else. And they love themselves. They give credit to themselves for everything that they do. He says that they're unholy. They, they hate holiness. They hate love, where it says unloving in verse 3. That's talking particularly about the kind of love that binds a family together. They're contrary to that love commitment that makes family last. They're opposed to that. I'm sure they're willing to receive it, but are they willing to give it? Are they in favor of sacrificing themselves to provide love to those who need it from them? They're against reconciliation and forgiveness. He says they're irreconcilable. You ever know anybody like that? Boy, I tell you, it makes a difference, doesn't it, to see somebody who's committed to reconciliation versus somebody who's committed to division. And sometimes I've counseled people in my church who've come with family problems or problems in their marriage. Now, on the one hand, I've got people like Daryl and Karen Cox. It's not been but one time in my pastoral ministry, Brother Jason, that I went to the hospital to visit the, visit the husband and then went to the jail to visit the wife. Daryl walked out of his house one night and took a shotgun blast to the liver from a fella, and they figured out pretty quickly that it was his wife's boyfriend who had lost his mind and had gone and thought, I'll get rid of him and then I'll have her. I'll tell you, Daryl survived. It took out part of his liver and he was able to recover from that. He's a member of First Baptist Church today. And Karen was exonerated because she didn't have anything to do with putting, him, putting the boyfriend up to this. And Jesus put their marriage back together. Amen. And they stayed faithful to one another all the way up until her death a couple of years ago. They were committed to reconciliation and to making it work. And then sometimes I have people come in and they say, well, the love's just gone. And you can't get them to forgive the grievances they have against one another. And when I think about them and I think about Daryl and Karen Cox, it makes me mad sometimes. <laughs> they forgave all of that. And if you think about what Jesus has forgiven you, he forgave you all of that. And yet we get to the point where we're against forgiveness. We're against reconciliation. We don't want to give because we love ourselves. We protest against the idea of reconciliation. We gossip maliciously. We're against self-control, control of our tongue, control of our appetites. Increasingly, there's an attitude in the world around us that self-control and self-denial are bad for you when they're the prescription from God to help us to live the life that is not difficult. And so all of these things, the Scripture says, are the pattern of living, the pathway of living, 
of men who sow destruction and trouble everywhere that they go. And he said, you have to avoid them. Listen, you preach the gospel to people who are on the wrong pathway, but he said, there are things you have to be careful about too. Because he says, listen, they're looking to enter. Among them are those who enter into households, enter into churches, enter into communities from all sorts of directions. They enter, they take captives, they captivate weak women weighed down with sins. There's a particular thing going on here in the church at Ephesus to which this is addressed where women are falling prey to the, to the teachings of some men who are doing all of this. But if you don't think men can be captivated by people who share error, then you and I know different men, I think. But here in Ephesus, he says they're coming in, they're captivating weak women who are weighed down with sins, who are led on by impulses, who are always learning but never able to settle on truth. He says that they're people who they, they enter, they hold captive, they rebel, they lead people in rebellion. He talks here about Jonas and Jambres. It's a, a fascinating story about the magicians who opposed Moses in Egypt. He said, they're just, they're just on a team. They don't care about what truth is, he says about them. They, they'll oppose the truth because they have a depraved mind, and they'll do whatever it takes to serve their team, to serve their party, to serve the jersey they're wearing, because they were on the Egyptian side. Even when they saw the greater power of Yahweh, even when they saw the things Moses was able to do, they stayed loyal to their team instead of loyal to the truth. And he said, these people who come in and make life difficult are people like that. But he gives the promise that they are not going to win in the end. We thank God for that. So you're commanded to do two things. You're commanded, or so far you are, you're commanded to accept that prophecy and to know that life is going to include some difficulties. But you are also commanded to avoid people like this in the midst of those troubles. Let me tell you why. Because when they enter and when they take captive, we've read lots of things about what's wrong with them. But it's trying to explain to us that you have to be careful about what people will do to you. People who are following this pathway of destruction make life difficult for believers, make life difficult in families, make life difficult in churches because of the ways that they can sneak in and twist our own feelings and emotions. Get us swept up into controversy. Get us swept up into hatred and division with one another. Get us swept up into their doctrinal compromise and cause us to consume ourselves. But there's a third command here. After hearing about a prophecy to accept and a pathway that people have chosen that we are to avoid, God has commanded us to find a place where we can abide. He tells him to continue, to remain. Look with me, if you will, at verse 14. Paul says to Timothy, you, however, continue Remain, abide in the things you have learned and become convinced of. God is telling us that the, the refuge against a difficult world is found in standing firm in the truth of the Word of God. That He has given to us a safe place. Look at what Paul says about the difference between remaining in God's Word and being swept away by the things that are in the world around us. Paul says, yeah, my life's been difficult. Look at what he says in verse 10 to Timothy. You followed my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love. All of those things are wonderful. But boy, it goes on from there, doesn't it? Because life can be difficult. My perseverance, my persecutions, my sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and at Lystra. But Jason, man, 
I, I heard my resume a while ago, and I wondered if you're talking about somebody else. So you listed all, all these things. He got this degree from there, and that degree from over in this other place. And here he has, he served in all these positions. And everything. Here's Paul's resume. I've been beaten in every town in this place, in the whole province of Asia. I'm on a first-name basis with all the lead jailers of the Roman Empire. That's Paul's resume every time he gives it about the things that he had suffered. At Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But when you stay in that refuge that God has given you, look at what he says. And out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Listen, you may be somebody who came into this room today. You've got family and friends who are turning the screws on you because of the changes that Jesus has made in your life. You don't know if you can stand the pressure. I'm telling you that the Lord will deliver you out of your time of trial. You may have come into this church through this church's Celebrate Recovery ministry. You may feel the challenges of addiction. You may feel the pressure and stress that that places on you weekly in a way that you look and you say, no matter how long I've made it, I don't know if I can make it through this week. I don't know if I can endure another night. Before I fall back into those old habits, let me tell you, God is faithful to provide with temptation a way of escape. And He is able to deliver you just as He did the Apostle Paul. When we cling to the way of escape, it will deliver us out of difficulty. And here's what it is. It's the Word of God. As we look at where we're supposed to remain, it's centered on the book that God has given us. We're told two things about the Bible that make all the difference. The first one is this. In here is everything you need to know to be saved. Look, look what he says. He says, continue in the things you've learned, verse 14, and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He said those sacred writings will make you wise to salvation. Man, I loved hearing the similarities of our story, Brother Jason, because I... I, although I get embarrassed to tell people this when I tell them God saved me when I was five, almost six. Because I know we've all seen churches that have taken kids that were way too young to know what they're doing and just ran them through the baptistry and dunked them and counted them as numbers. And I get a little nervous about telling people five-year-old conversion because I know some of y'all in a congregation this big got to be a little bit judgy, you know. And you're sitting back there and you're thinking, I bet that wasn't true. I don't know. They shouldn't have done that. He was way too young for that. Well, let me tell you what I think made the difference. I had a mama who started teaching me from when I was little. Uh, in fact, can I tell you something? Can I tell you something about that? I know that I am the only person in this room that's got a tie on, except for my brother-in-law, Matt. And I know that I have violated probably California penal code in some way or another <laughs> by wearing a tie to a meeting like this. But they tell us that my mom's in the last weeks of her life due to Alzheimer's. And she loves her preacher boy in a tie. And blue is her favorite color. And when I show up dressed like this, sometimes... She knows who I am. And so I'm wearing this in honor of her today. So mom started teaching me early on. And then the other thing is, I went to a little bitty poor church way out in the country. That's where I grew up. And, you know, we'd have to say the nearest town is someplace you've never heard of. And at that little church, we didn't have enough money to do anything extra with the kids. 
And so our plan for the children was simply this. Mom put us in our pew, sat us there, went to sing in the choir, and it was just like Pavlov and that bell with those dogs. She had trained us that <clears throat> meant that we would die <laughs> if we continued to make any noise whatsoever <laughs> in the midst of that congregation. And she has the amazing ability to sing Jesus Loves Me while giving the evil eye at 20 yards. <laughs> you know, just make your blood run cold in your veins. And so as a result of that, from when I was very young, unable to do anything else, I sat and listened to the proclamation of the Word of God about my sin and my Savior and my need. And God brought me, even at that young age, to a comprehension of the truth of the gospel and my need for it. Because ultimately, you don't need to achieve a grade level. The scriptures contain everything you need to become wise to salvation in Jesus Christ. The scriptures don't contain just that because, you know, there's some people who look and say, well, you know, in the Bible you've got what you need to get saved, but all that other stuff, it may be right, it may be wrong. We're going to pick the parts that we think matter the gospel, and we're going to pick the parts we think don't matter the gospel. Uh-uh. No, there's more to it than that. He says in verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God, every word of it, every book of it, every chapter and verse of it, in fact, I've got strong feelings about the maps in the back. I think, <laughs> I think they may be pretty good too. All Scripture is inspired by God and it is all profitable. All of it is profitable. I tuned in this morning to First Baptist Farmersville and watched online as James Cheeseman, our worship pastor, preached because, Will, you can preach. I know you're trained to be a pastor, and my worship pastor can preach too. And he preached a good job this morning. He hates, absolutely hates serving with me because when he has to preach, he doesn't get to preach just what he wants to. We are preaching through at First Baptist Farmersville right now the book of Leviticus. And so James had to preach out of Leviticus this morning, the worship pastor had to preach out of Le Leviticus. Let me tell you why. I track the books that I've preached and the books that I haven't preached. We're almost done here. Hang on just a second. I, preach, I track the books that I preach and the books that I don't preach. And a couple of years ago, I sent out an email and I said to the church, be praying for me. By the way, here are some books I haven't preached yet in 23 years. Leviticus was in that list. And one of my deacons emailed me and said, Brother Bart, I hope I'm dead before you get to Leviticus. And I said... <laughs> I said, Leviticus it is. That's next. I told my congregation, you're going to love Leviticus or I'm going to die trying. One or the other. Because all Scripture is inspired by God, even Leviticus. And all Scripture is profitable. So here's the thing. I said, the Scripture, is, it's that... It's that refuge because there's where you find what you need to know to be saved. And the second part of it is there's what you find in order to be equipped to withstand the world around you. It says all scripture is inspired by God. It's all profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so when you face difficult times and you encounter difficult people and you're not sure whether you can make it, I'm telling you that the answer is in here. The answer is in here to deliver you out of the domain of darkness and into the light of the truth. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, let me tell you something. In 10 minutes, I knew Huntington Beach Church knows how to show you the way. 
You come and you talk to this pastor. You do it today because you don't know what tomorrow holds in difficult times. You come and you, they got 50 pastors in here. Find one of them. <laughs> Find one of them and ask them about the way to salvation and they can show you from the scriptures how you can be saved. And if you've already accepted Christ, but the times are so difficult that you don't feel equipped to be the Christian you ought to be, the answer is in here. And these pastors can show you, and you can see for yourself as you love God's Word and study it, how God can equip you for the crises that are ahead. One last thing, I believe that's true for your individual life. I believe that's true for Huntington Beach Church. And I believe that's true for the family of churches to which Huntington Beach Church belongs, the Southern Baptist Convention. We may look and see the problems that we face at every level along the way, and we may feel that we are not equipped to face them. But at least we know where the answers are found. And may we all of us, individually and all together, run to the Word of God and find there how He can bring us together to serve Him to His glory. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Brother Jason is going to come. Father, I thank you for the truth of Scripture that tells us what to expect and tells us what we can do about it. Lord, Lord, may your Spirit reach into the hearts of anyone here who does not know you and call them in the midst of the difficult times around us where life seems unbearable to come and find rescue and refuge in you. Stri strip away from them their pride. Strip away from them the, their love of themselves. And draw them, Lord, to yourself that they might find healing and wholeness and truth. And strengthen your children. Raise up your church and the truth of your word that we might be equipped to face these days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, Amen Pastor. Thank you.